Okay, so you can call this uh, the Mexican Federal Union Part 2. And as we pick up in our lecture today, where I am going uh, to head next is really the three major uh is the third part or the third leg of the proverbial stool in Mexico in this 1820s, 1830s time period. Uh, as a reminder, you're going to have Mexico dominated not by the majority, not by the masses of the people, which are the Native Americans, Indians, Indios, as they call them. Uh, you're not going to have Mexico dominated by that caste of society. But Mexico as a governed society is going to be dominated really by about three groups of individuals. In the last lecture, uh, we uh, met with the army and we saw how they're set up and run. They're very political. Also, frankly, they have a, their hand in the till. They're corrupt. Uh, the gunpowder is the example I used in the last class. Uh, but in addition to that, you're also going to see the church uh, to be a very powerful uh, voice in Mexican society. Uh, the church, because of its, uh, the Catholic church to be more specific, uh, the Roman Catholic church, because Mexico and before Mexico, Spain had been officially a Catholic nation. Me uh, without a doubt, Me Catholicism was the dominant religion or dominant uh, force in Mexican religious society. And it transcends religion. It doesn't just stay within the sphere of the church. Uh, you'll see uh, the Catholic Church uh, play uh, a, a large role within society uh, in the form of uh, uh, money uh, and power and political influence and so forth. And I think I made this remark too. The Catholic Church owned about six, excuse me, about 50% of the gross domestic product of Mexico in this time period where we're looking at. But so the third pillar of society, the third leg of the stool uh, to go along with the church and to go along with the army, the real dominant forces that the movers and elites of society are going to be the uh, what you can call the Blancos, those uh, elites. Again, so we're clear about this. The Peninsularis, they're the smallest group in all of Mexican society. Those are the pure-blooded Spaniards who were born in Spain. The Peninsularis are the ones, as a reminder, are the ones who are going to say if, if your wife was pregnant, you'd put her on a boat, send her back across the Atlantic Ocean to have that child in Spain to maintain that proper uh, bloodline. This stuff matters. may seem ridiculous to us uh, here in 2021, uh, but that's the way they rolled and that's the way they did. And underneath the Peninsularis are going to be your um, Criollos, Criollos. So the Criollos, so a larger portion of the pure-blooded Spanish society, as a reminder, the Criollos, they will be born in in Mexico. Uh, front, uh, pure-blooded Spaniards born in Mexico. Uh, and the thing, though, is, is that, uh, and, I believe, and I've seen this, uh, it was Don Frazier in those uh, videos that I've got linked, but I've seen it in print elsewhere. Uh, but basically, uh, a lot of Spaniards look upon those Criollos as kind of uh, rubes, as uh, frontier bumpkins almost. Uh, not unlike, say, New Yorkers looking upon Texans uh, it, as kind of those uh, wild and woolly sorts, even though they may, uh, we all may be 100% American or something like that. But anyways, uh, obviously, it, it does matter. But in this elite society here, these are the guys who are going to rule the roost. And so now we really turn not just to the fact we're talking about the Criollos versus the Peninsularis once more, but we're talking about the politics of Mexico in this 1820s and 1830s time period. So here we are, the politics of Mexico, the political parties of Mexico. And in fact, you're going to have essentially two political parties in Mexico during this 1820s, uh, early 1830s time period under the Constitution of 1824. The first, first thing to remember about these political parties is they are uh, dominated by the Masonic Lodge. Uh, for some of you, you're familiar with the Masonic Lodge because your grandpa is a Freemason. Others may be, have a, a father is a Freemason, maybe, but I'm guessing probably most of you do not. But anyways, the Masonic Lodge over the years has been accused of being uh, a part of the Illuminati, a part of those who really control the purse strings of society and so on. Uh, but if you if you haven't if you've seen my ring or at least another ring that I'm wearing, this is a Masonic ring too. I'm a Mason, and I don't control anything other than the four walls that you see around me. Well, anyways, but in Mex in Mexican society in the 1820s, and also it's worth noting in American society, political society in the 1820s and 30s as well, a lot a lot of Masons running around. The difference between the United States branch of the Masonic Lodge and the Mexican branch of the Masonic Lodge is, is that the American branch was not nearly as overtly politically active. 
uh, you do not have a, an avowed uh, Masonic Lodge or Masonic political party in the United States in this time period. In the 1820s and 30s in the United States, you have what is called the anti-Masonic political party. And uh, there was a whole lot of controversy that does not need to be taught, brought about here in a Texas history class. But in Mexico, where we're most interested in, in the, today's lecture, yes, that is very true. Uh, the Mexican two political parties represent the two factions within the, the Masonic bodies of Mexico. Uh, one faction you can put in your notes is going to be called the Yorkino, Yorkino, like York Right, Y-O-R-K-I-N-O, -O, the Yorkino Federalists. Oftentimes you will see them described as uh, Federalist in textbooks, and that's not wrong. But I want you to write that phrase down, Yorkino Federalist, because uh, before they were Federalists, um, anyways, before they were Federalist, they, in a sense, they were Yorkino or York Right Masons. Uh, it, the York Right is a, an appendant body in the Masonic Lodge, uh, to, say the, uh, to say it simply. So, you're, say, put this in your notes, give you some examples of prominent Yorkino Federalists uh, during the 20s and the 1830s. Uh, one name would be uh, someone you're familiar with or should be have, should have seen somewhere in Texas along the route is a guy named Lorenzo de Zavala. And I might even have mentioned Zavala in the last class. But Lorenzo de Zavala, born in the Yucatan, trained as a doctor, uh, kind of a young wunderkind, uh, which basically kind of this young uh, man who was just on a, a rocket ship to prominence in Mexico by the time he's in his 30s, uh, early, uh, early to mid-30s. Lorenzo de Zavala is one of the most prominent faces of Yorkino federalism in, uh, in uh, Mexico. In addition to that, here's another name for your notes that might actually surprise you. And his name is Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, or Santana, as it was more properly pronounced. Uh, if you went to seventh grade Texas history in Texas public schools, which most of you did, um, you know, you probably got it from old coaches, uh, Santa Ana or something like that. And you can say it like that. That's fine. It's like saying San Jacinto. It's, it, it's fine. But Santana is probably more properly pronounced. It, and the thing is, is that the reason I say that might surprise you is, is that we in Texas over the years have been taught and have uh, kind of conceived the Santana as this dictatorial despot. And he is. But the thing that as we get into talking about Santana in this class today is that Santana is a kind of a man to himself. He, he is whatever he needs to be to advance his career. Or as I have said over the years teaching this subject, because uh, I'm a baseball fan, if you've ever been to uh, Cooperstown, New York, where uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame is located, when you go and you are enshrined into Cooperstown, and the thing to remember is, is that they will ask you, uh, Greg Maddox, Nolan Ryan, uh, let me think here a second, Ty Cobb, blah, 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 and on and on we go. Uh, do you want to, what uh, cap do you want to wear? Uh, meaning, what do you want to be recognized as? Are you primarily a White Sox or a Ranger or a uh, uh, Oakland Athletic, New York Yankee or something else? Uh, it, because some of those, especially in the old days, it didn't matter as much because like a Ty Cobb only played for Detroit. But later on, after free agency, you've got men uh, who will have Hall of Fame careers who will play for multiple teams. And so they ask, what do you want to be enshrined as? And there are a few guys who say, I, I love money that most of my teams that I played for. Say the, the Cubs, uh, for thinking of me, Greg Maddox, uh, the great uh, pitcher from the 1990s. Uh, he was a, uh, he was, he made probably won his most games as an as a Atlanta Brave. Uh, but he also won a lot of games for the Chicago Cubs and is a beloved figure for that organization as well. So he has no uh, formal affiliation in the Hall. But one man, uh, and to make this uh, overly long analogy to bring it to a conclusion, one man, probably the greatest leadoff hitter in the history of Major League Baseball is a guy named Ricky uh, Henderson. Ricky Henderson was fast as lightning, mercurial in personality, an all-around great player, a Hall of Famer. Uh, but he, because of the way he was, the mercurial nature of his uh, being, he could burn bridges, and he played on about half a dozen teams, maybe closer to eight or nine teams, before he finally retired. And someone asked, uh, the one sports reporter asked about Ricky Henderson, uh, what is he going to go in as, in an Oakland Athletic or New York Yankee, because that's when he was at his prime. And this, the guy replied, this other man, this other sports writer replied back, he said, no, 
he's going to have a cap on that says RA, or excuse me, RH for Ricky Henderson. Ricky Henderson. And in that same sort of way, that's this is uh, where I'm going here. It's the same sort of way Antonio Lopez de Santana, we will find him all over the place politically in Mexico uh, during his career. You, especially here we are in Texas history in the 1820s and 30s, you will find Santana starting out as a royalist Spanish uh, uh, subject, and he fights for the Spanish for years and years, and then after uh, it looks like the Spanish are about to fa fail, he quits them and becomes a, re a rebel. After, uh, after that happens, then he becomes a, uh, a, an a Iterbetist, or he, he backs the Emperor Iterbeti to the hilt, and then he betrays Iterbeti and then becomes a Yorkino Federalist, and then at times is a centralist. Then he gets this and that. My point is this, is that Santana, he would have worn an SA for his last name. He was always out for himself. Whatever helped him out the most, uh, that was the thing. And he's extraordinarily fascinating to me as a, a historical figure. But those two uh, are, are major players, uh, Lorenzo de Zavala, uh, Santana, uh, and there are many others we just simply, in a sense, don't need to really worry about. I, actually, I should add one more. His name is Gomez Farias, F-A-R-I-A-S. Uh, he's a future, uh, Gomez Farias uh, is going to be a future uh, president or interim president of Mexico and president of Mexico half a dozen times himself. Uh, and by the way, the last thing I would add to your notes about these Yorkino Federalists, uh, at least about who's uh, members of the party, write this down. Most Texians, most Texians in the 1820s and the 1830s, until the rupture of 1835, the break of 1835, the vast majority of Texians are Federalists, are Yorkino Federalists. Many of the men in Texas are Freemasons from the United States or Mexico, but they're all Yorkino, most Texians are Yorkino Federalists. And last but not least, and you'll see me say this again, there are going to be uh, a lot of Texians who back Antonio Lopez de Santana in the early 1830s. Because it, uh, the reason I say this, this might surprise you, is because I'm guessing a lot of you were uh, weaned on the notion from Coach's class, if, you, if, if Coach was teaching anything at all, is, is that Santana was a despot. Santana was wicked and Texans hated, Texians excuse me, hated him. And that's true. But before they hated him, they loved him. It's, it's a fascinating tale, and it's, it's part of our uh, Texas history. So uh, the Yorkino Federalists, what do they believe in? So let's uh, talk about their beliefs and their uh, practices and subjects. When you call someone a Federalist as a political party, especially here in Mexico, what you're saying is, is that you are a staunch supporter of the... Uh, the Federalist Constitution of 1824. Probably ought to remember that document, the Constitution of 1824. It's a big document in our Texas history, in Texas history, because it so directly affects, and uh, it is a document we lived under in this state uh, while we were part of Mexico. Constitution of 1824 gave a lot of power to the states. That's uh, that's really where we're talking about the sharing of power between Mexico City, the hub of the Mexican government, and the states flung out through the Federal Republic of Mexico. So, I mean, a state like Zacatecas, probably ought to write that down. Zacatecas, let's see here if I can uh, get this typed into the chat bar. Z-A-C-A-T-E-C-A-S, Zacatecas. Uh, of the states in Mexico, uh, and I've mentioned Zacatecas offhand to you earlier in this course, uh, is, is that Zacatecas is one of the more wealthy states within the Federal Union of Mexico because of those old uh, silver and gold mines that were within its borders. Uh, they, had, they, the state of Zacatecas, had a lot of sway and pull over where that money could be spent, what was done with that money that went into the public uh, purse, and so on. Zacatecas was a staunch defender of federalism because they enjoyed their prerogatives. Uh, and I would add this too in your notes too, these federalists are going to be staunch defenders and promoters of, write this down, uh, state militias, formal state militias, organized state militias. And what I mean by that is organized like something akin to our National Guard, things that we do, uh, things that are formally organized and, and um I guess you could say armed and supplied by, in this case, the state of Zacatecas. Uh, by the way, a state militia, uh, an informal organization of a bunch of concerned citizens gathering together to defend their rights. I should hasten to add this to your notes, and I would write it down and underline, it, underline this, because it's one of the problems Texians have, is, is that uh, 
in the United States, in the old Anglo tradition, it is extraordinarily, excuse me, it's not extraordinarily, it is just simply okay. It is simply fine for concerned citizens to organize in the 1820s and 30s into militia outfits that are essentially kind of quasi-private uh, groups, uh, concerned citizens banding together to protect the community. That's the way the Anglos do it. However, in Mexico, which comes out of the Spanish-Hispanic tradition, of course, uh, that legal tradition that goes along with it, a bunch of private citizens who band together and are armed and are protecting their rights is absolutely fundamentally revolutionary. And, and I don't mean revolutionary in a good way. I mean revolutionary like sedition, insurrection, uh, nasty stuff. And for a lot of Mexicans who are, again, now when I say Mexicans, I'm referring specifically to those who are, uh, if you're in Texas, a Tejano, or if you're in Mexico uh, proper, the interior of Mexico, a Mexican of Hispanic uh, ethnicity uh, in that background. If you see a bunch of people organizing and taking up guns and parading and marching around uh, without, any, not, without any sanction or allowance by the state, that is dangerous territory. It's a cultural difference that uh, sometimes is overlooked uh, in our history. But a lot of, uh, but the, still all that to say though is that Zacatecas, Coahuila, e Texas, uh, Tamaulipas, and a, hand, a couple of other states were really prominent Federalists. They believed uh, that the states had a large role to play. They believed also, put this in your notes, that the states should administer the land. It should be the states that give away the land. It should be the states that try to entice uh, settlers to this area. All that to say is, is that uh, uh, it should be the states, not Mexico City, that handles the question of what do we do with the land. And in Texas, as you've already, uh, you should have seen through those lectures when I talked about Stephen F. Austin, Green DeWitt, Martin De Leon, and the others, uh, all that issue about who gets the land and where does those titles come from, that's all going to uh, flow from Mexico City, but is going to be purified and really administered by uh, uh, Coahuila e Texas, which then goes on to Austin and DeWitt and De Leon and these other guys. So all that to say is, is that land and who handles the land, that's, that's a big issue right there. Also something else, religiously speaking, and this is uh, kind of an undercurrent in Mexico in the 1820s, the Yorkino Federalists are going to be uh, kind of ambivalent about the Catholic Church. Uh, ambivalent, what I mean by that is, is that they have, are, are mixed feelings about the Catholic Church. Is the Catholic Church good for Mexico? Does the Roman Catholic Church encourage uh, enlightenment ideas, republic ideas? Who should control the land it, that the church controls? Should the church be allowed to continue to do what they do? Or should the church be divorced from the land? And should the state start to do this or that? Uh, should the state take uh, power away from the church? So that was a, a major issue too. Another problem for the Yorkino Federalists as well, and something that, that was uh, uh, something that, that ground their gears was a lot of these Yorkino Federalists were old Criollos and some of them are mestizo actually the further you get away from Mexico City but the fact of the matter is most of these fellows are going to be what we might call middle class upper middle class that sort of thing these Yorkino Federalists don't like the Peninsularis that much and one of the great complaints and one of the great uh, upsetting things that helps bring down Yorkino federalism in the 1830s is, is that, and I'd write this down, the Yorkinos considered a bill, not a bill in the Mexican Congress. They considered a bill in, the, in about 1833, maybe it was 34, but they were debating a bill not only to strip the Peninsularis of their land. So in essence, you're going to take not just the land away from the church, but you're also going to take the land away from the, um, from the elite of the Spanish-born, Spanish pure-blooded elite Peninsularis. You're going to take their land away too. So just think about this. Uh, I am convinced the older I get, that if, if you really want to stir the pot and you want to get people mad, and if you want to get them up in arms, perhaps nothing does it better than when you start talking about destroying their and taking away their economic uh, abilities, or say it a little differently, uh, you, you look like you're trying to impoverish them. Uh, you're taking away their money, to be to just frankly blunt. But beyond just taking away the Peninsularis land, there was even a discussion and a bill being debated in 1834 in the Mexican Congress that by the Orquino Federalists of essentially banishing 
uh, and driving from the midst of the Mexicans the Spanish Peninsularis that were still left in Mexico. Some had left after the revolution, most did not. But there was a d bill discussing, shall we d uh, run off? Shall we force on the boats and send them back to Spain, as it were, those Peninsularis? Didn't go anywhere, but that's out there. And if you were a Peninsularis and you're a formerly or you are a powerful man or woman, you are going to be absolutely alarmed by what you're seeing. So you have that as the problem there. So, and here's another uh, issue for the uh, Yorkino Federalist. Uh, for the Yorkino Federalist, one of the questions would be is who's our friend? Who's Mexico's friend? Your answer should be in your notes from the Yorkino perspective, it would be the United States to uh, in a large degree. Also, uh, and France for that matter as well. But the thing is, is that the Yorkinos look to the United States as kind of a friendly neighbor. That's uh, a major division point right there. And uh, all the, in, in the Yorkinos will have their own newspapers. They have their own uh, political factions. They have their own Masonic lodges. Uh, this is a, a full affair. And really at the center of it all, I should underline this point to you as well, uh, at the center of the Yorkino faction is going to be Lorenzo de Zavala. He is the, the loudest voice and the most brilliant thinker and writer for the Yorkinos in the eight, late 1820s. Uh, he is going to at times be a, uh, a friend of and an ally politically of the first Mexican president, Guadalupe Victoria. But really, as time goes along in 1829, it will be De Zavala who is the, the power behind the throne, as it were. But uh, I've talked a long time about the Yorkino Federalists, especially since they're going to be the dominant force in, uh, in Texas, uh, Mexican Texas. Uh, but the opposition to the Yorkino Federalists is another one of these Masonic Lodge bodies. And, um, the, uh, they are called in English the Scottish Rite. So for those of you who are from Dallas or Houston or San Antonio, uh, Austin too for that matter, there are what are called Scottish Rite Cathedrals. Uh, the one I'm a member of is down in San Antonio. Da uh, I'm in Houston now, actually, but I was uh, got my degrees in San Antonio at the Scottish Rite Cathedral in San Antonio, Texas. Anyways, it's, these are some big buildings. Those were all built. Most of these things were built in the late 19th and early 20th century with a few exceptions when fraternal organizations were in their prime. In Mexico, they're not called the Scottish Rite, obviously in English, but in translated into uh, Spanish, it comes out Escocesis. The Escocesis. So in this case here, the other political party, the opposition to the Yorkino Federalist will be the Escocesis Centralists. The Escocesis Centralists. So let me spell that for you. Uh, it kind of sounds like it kind of sounds like it uh, or spells like it sounds. E-S-C-O-C-E-S-E-S. -E -E the Escocesis. So the Escocesis or the Scottish right, or the Scottish uh, political party there in Mexico, uh, they're the centralists. Those are the fellows that you might have thought Antonio Lopez de Santana would have been a member of. And he will at times be a member of their organization too. Uh, their leading light, uh, opposite of, say, Lorenzo de Zavala, is a prominent man named Lucas Alaman. A-L-A-M-A-N. Lucas Alaman. Now, Lucas Aleman is, uh, is, is just as brilliant as the De Zavala, but he comes from an elite background and status. Um, some differences, uh, obviously, some of the differences we talked about with the Orkino, what did they favor it would be kind of simple to go opposite. Uh, for the Esco C centralist, which would include a lot of peninsularis, they valued the power in Mexico to be really held within Mexico City. Unlike a, dis a sharing of the power or dispersing of power from uh, governmental power from Mexico all the way uh, out to the far flung states, the Escocesis would say the real power must be in Mexico City and that the states should take a very much lower uh, status. And in effect, in some cases, you might say the states basically should be like French administrative districts. Uh, they basically are just minions and subjects of the federal gov government of Mexico or the central government of Mexico City. So that would be one. You will find the Escocesis to be far more in favor of uh, maintaining the old ways. Now, these Escocesis are not, I guess you could say, neo-Spaniards. Um, what I mean by that is they're not 
uh, neo-Spaniards in the sense that they wish were a, a return of the Spanish. They don't. They're Mexican. However, for the Escoceses, I would write this in your notes, they have a very uh, much, a, in my opinion, rose-colored glasses view of the Spanish era. They would say that the Spanish needed to be driven out. The Spanish time period was over. However, there were many things that the Spanish did right. They are our ancestors. We, we take a common heritage and legacy from them culturally and, <clears throat> and also governmentally. So we like that. And so we, we value that, that bureaucracy that the Spanish gave to us. We value that cultural heritage that the Spanish gave to us. Uh, we change it on the margins. We change it in, in some substantive ways. But in the main, we like what the Spanish did. We back the Catholic Church. We are not going to attack the privileges and prerogatives of the church. We're not going to attack the land uh, and the pr uh, possessions of the Catholic Church. We're not going to attack and try to drive out of our midst uh, the Peninsularis. We're not going to do those sorts of things there. Oh, by the way, we like the British. And last but not least, we don't trust the Americans. We think the Americans are a real threat to us uh, in one way or the other. And so uh, you will see them, uh, these two groups, the Escoceses on the one hand and the Yorkino Federalists on the other, they will go after each other hammer and tong in the 1820s, especially for the presidency of Mexico uh, in these various elections. So uh, when we talk about uh, these uh, groups here and their, their organization, so we've got them set. Politics in Mexico is, uh, is set by calendar just like it is in the United States. They're both republics in the 1820s. However, as I said in the last class to you, or uh, the last lecture, I swear I did anyways, the thing is, is that uh, Mexico, uh, their calendar doesn't work quite like the United States. Whereas in the United States where you could say, uh, I'm a Republican, uh, you're a Democrat, or to say it more correctly for that time period, I'm a Democrat and you're a Whig. Uh, we ran, but we lost. We're the, we being the, the, the Whigs, we ran Henry Clay and lost. And so we don't try to fight it out. We don't try to overthrow the, uh, the election and, and you know storm the Capitol or whatever. The fact of the matter is, is that did not take place in Mexico. And it really is going to rip at the, uh, the, the new mortar of the, of the state of Mexico or the, the nation of Mexico. This year is important for your notes. And that year is 1829 in our story. 1829. And, and we're still in Mex in the heart of Mexico. Texas is, is, like I said to you last time, remember, Texas is a far-flung outpost. And uh, Texas is like North Dakota to Mexico City. You, you only worry about it when something bad's really happening or about to happen. And you, you deal with it, kind of, and then you move on with life because there's much more important things closer to home. So in 1829, though, uh, one of the great worries of both the Yorkinos and, to a certain degree, even the Escoceses, but the Yorkinos are uh, going to be in power, is one of the great worries is what about the Spanish? Will they try to come back? But 1829 is a big year, not just for the Spanish invasion of Mexico. That's going to be one. So you've got two major events in 1829 that are just going to absolutely rock Mexico and make it uh, uh, just really, it's, it's never this... Arguably, it's never the same again. I think the, the problems were already there and they were already manifesting anyhow. But 29 is probably a watershed moment, kind of, a, I would say, a turning point for the Federal Republic of Mexico. Because in 1828, December 28, early 29, you're going to have had an election for president of Mexico. The president of Mexico runs on about a five-year term, excuse me excuse me, four-year term, uh, and he, Guadalupe Victoria, cannot succeed himself. So he... Victoria stands down. So he's out. Now, I will say this again about Victoria. I think Victoria is a good man. I think Victoria is a good president of Mexico. The problem with Guadalupe Victoria is that he's not George Washington, but very few people can be George Washington. There's, in a sense, only one Washington. There's only one Simon Bolivar or whatever. My point is this, is that on, in, in the American Revolution, Washington was the indispensable man. In the first eight years of the American Republic under the, Constitu the present U.S. Constitution, there was President Washington, who was the steady hand, the non-despotic steady hand, uh, who came to power and then left power willingly. Washington was also viewed as an indispensable man in the Revolution and, in a sense, in the first years of the Republic. 
Victoria is a good man and a good uh, a president, a good presiding officer, a good chief executive, a decent general, but he's not uh, indispensable. He's not that kind of near God's status. He never had that that Washington did. There were lots of other men who wanted uh, the power. And Victoria could not succeed himself. Victoria could not run for re-election. In 1828, uh, December 28th, the election in Mexico was going to be decided not by ballots cast in a, a national election like we just did this past year, uh, but it will be decided by the state legislatures per the Constitution. And the way the state legislatures were set up, it was going to be clear that in 1828, going into 1829, the new president of Mexico would be an Escocis. He would be... Uh, Oh, gosh, uh, uh, Anastasio Bustamante. Uh, what was his name? Gomez Pedraza. Gomez Pedraza. Don't worry about his name. I'm not going to ask you that. However, uh, though, the thing is, is that when we talk about uh, what, what these the events in the post-election time period, is, is that many Yorkino Federalists came to the conclusion, especially De Zavala, Lorenzo De Zavala, that Yorkino light, a lot of those Yorkino Federalists in 1829, now January of 29, come to the conclusion the Republic is in peril. The country is in danger. If we give up power, if we, ref if we allow the Escoceses to take control, we will never gain power back in Mexico once more. Our enemies will attack us and crush us. So do we wait? No. We must attack and we must not allow the Escoceses Esco ceases to take power. Pedraza cannot take power. Okay, fine. And so you will see the a coup, uh, a putsch, uh, to use the German phrase, but you will see a coup fomented by the Yorkino Federalists where they go, in the case of Zavala, he kind of goes nuts for a day or two and starts shooting them. The problem here, and this is a big one, it really starts with Iterbidi. When they, uh, they, the Mexican elite, uh, executed Irbidi, uh, the old emperor, uh, right after the revolution was over. The problem is this, and it's a bad genie that comes out of the bottle. It's a bad omen. It's a bad, uh, when you open this Pandora's box, it's, it, you can't put her back in very easily. But when you start shooting your political enemies, and you start uh, spilling blood to stay in power, eventually, maybe very quickly, your political enemies take their guns and they start shooting back. And you start violating those peaceful norms of the peaceful transfer of power. The Yorkino Federalists did it first, but the Escocese will do it too. And so it damns Mexico. It would damn any nation, frankly. But in this case, it damns Mexico to perpetual turbulence uh, and despotry because of the factions fighting it back and forth. Not just rhetorically, but in this case with guns and, and, and truncheons. So the Yorkinos refused to leave power. The Yorkinos refused to be uh, to lose, in a sense, and so they impose upon their government. They impose upon the government their own man, and their man. Uh, you need to write this man's name down. This was the the uh, candidate, the Yorkino candidate for president in 1828, early 29. His name is Vicente Guerrero, G U E R R E R O, Vicente Guerrero, and as you, if we showed it on the list of the heads of state of Mexico in the last class, you might have noticed that Guerrero, like many of those others, wore a uniform. Vicente Guerrero, like Guadalupe Victoria, like Anastasio Bustamante, like uh, Santana, all of them uh, had served in the upper echelons of the armies during the revolution, and some of them continued to serve. Uh, Vicente Guerrero was a kind of a crude, kind of coarse, uh, backwoods, uh, Criollo. And in this sense, what hurts him is, is that a lot of people look at him, especially the days of Allahs who are frankly brilliant, and they laugh at him behind his back, and they were supposed to be serving him. But President Guerrero is sworn in, frankly, at the hands of, uh, at the, because of a coup. He had lost, but now he becomes president of Mexico illegitimately. And that is a bad, bad omen. Then the second part of the, the, the turbulent and fateful year of 1829 takes hold in that guess who shows up along the coast of Mexico in the early summer, late spring of 1829? It's none other than the most feared and, and worried about return of the Spanish. As I said to you before, 
as I said to you before, the Spanish had never really given up hope of taking back Mexico. The Spanish had always kind of uh, felt it was illegitimate, that Mexico was their, their rightful and just basically God-ordained territory. And in a sense, for 300 years, it was. But here we are in 1829, they have returned. The problem, though, is, is that Mexico, as I'd said to you previously, Mexico had kept a big army around uh, to uh, ward off this invasion. The problem was the Mexican army, especially amongst the leadership, was uh, suspect at best. There in 1829, however, the Spanish are going to land an invasion force along the Gulf Coast of Mexico at a town called Tampico, T-A-M-P-I-C-O. Tampico, Mexico, north of Veracruz up the coast, headed towards uh, South Texas, as it were, about uh, not quite halfway. But anyways, Tampico is a sizable port, and this invasion force is a sizable operation. Um, several thousand Spanish soldiers, will, soldados, will come in. The thing is, the Mexican army was big uh, and uh, somewhat equipped, but not very well equipped uh, and certainly not very well led. It was too unwieldy and simply just not uh, uh, sophisticated enough to uh, basically lock horns and just straight up slug it out with this Spanish invasion force. The man who was going to be charged with saving Mexico, saving the Republic of Mexico, and frankly, to become a hero of Mexico is our friend Antonio Lopez de Santana. President Guerrero, President Guerrero, that illegitimate president of the Yorkinos, appoints Yorkino general. You're not going to appoint your political enemies, especially in just in the, the blood's barely dry on, from the street uh, fighting. You're going to appoint one of your own generals, Santana. And Santana arrays his army around Tampico. And he recognizes rather quickly, Santana does, that his army cannot drive the Spanish back into the ocean. So what Santana does is the next best thing. He basically cordons off and he basically creates a, I guess you could call it like a quarantine around Tampico. Because they were headed, they, Tampico, and just simply the calendar, is heading into the summer months. So... Santana guessed, and I think there was some intelligence, and I, don't, I mean this in the sense like uh, espionage information sort of thing, that the troops that had come in with the Spanish had no natural immunity to yellow fever. The Mexicans don't call it yellow fever. Please put it in your notes as vomito, V-O-M-I-T-O, like vomit with an O. Vomito, yellow fever. And each summer, Along the Gulf Coast of Mexico, Texas, and the United States, anywhere along in that part of the world, there is going to be a yellow fever outbreak just as sure as the sun rises. And in 1829, the summer of 1829, sure enough, the mosquitoes did what they always did. They came forward and they consumed the soldados. They consumed the Spanish soldados and a few Mexican soldiers as well. The thing is, is that the Spanish had no immunity. These these men were not did not had not uh, received natural immunity by being infected by yellow fever and surviving. And the uh, even if you don't die from yellow fever, it renders you essentially uh, helpless. It renders you broken physically for at least some time. Many Mexican, excuse me, many Spanish soldados do die of yellow fever in 1829. And on top of that, not only do they don't, some die from it, others are basically knocked out. They are casualties, as it were. And so when Santana receives information saying the time was ripe, he was then able to press and essentially break the Spanish invasion. And by process of doing that, Santana, please put this in your notes, becomes the hero of Mexico. Santana, there is no two ways about it. He is, at times, a hero of Mexico. It was Santana who turns back the Spanish at Tampico, and it will be Santana years later, a few years later, at what Veracruz, who turns back the French invasion of Mexico. Santana is a real hero of Mexico. The problem, though, is, is that when you take power like Vicente Guerrero did, which were through a coup, it would have been much better politically and governmentally for Guerrero to have taken himself and has gone as president. He's an old general and said, I will defend Mexico. I will go to Tampico. I will protect Mexico and did it himself. But he didn't. Because, and so when he didn't do that, any glory and any credit that could have been attached to Guerrero, President General Guerrero, will be attached to Santana. 
throw into the next mix this uh, ever-present problem for Mexico. It is always churning in the background. I've mentioned it several times to you now uh, today and in the last lecture, is that Mexico was perpetually low on money. It was perpetually low on money. And as I mentioned to you in the last class, the fact was is that you will see how, how much it cost uh, for just to pay for these, this army to be in the field, to pay for the army to protect Mexico. It basically bankrupts the treasury and causes uh, much heartache and consternation through the nation. Here's the, an example. To pay for the army to fight in the field uh, against the Spanish, uh, they, they, the Mexican government, Guerrero's government, had to raise taxes. They did. And so when they raise taxes, they raise taxes uh, in this way on what you might call a property tax uh, and also a license tax. Uh, essentially, uh, it goes like this. For a home in Mexico City, it costs four pesos uh, to buy a, a modest home. It costs 20 pesos for a marriage license in Mexico in 1829 to pay for all this, this uh, protection. This sort of thing, uh, along with the illegitimacy and the coup and all that, basically erodes Guerrero, uh, and his government is going to be thrown out of power in the, at the, by the end of 1829. Guerrero only lasts for the better part of a year, and then he is tossed out of power. Guerrero is gone. Eventually, I would write this down. Guess what happens to Vicente Guerrero? He gets stood on a wall and shot. So we've shot um, Iturbide. Now we've shot the second president of Mexico. The blood flows, and that's not a good thing to do. If you remember from last time when we looked at the list of the heads of state of Mexico, you will see a few interim presidents, and that was true. The next president of Mexico worth mentioning because the centralists come back and are going to cleanse the proverbial temple. The next president of Mexico is a fellow named Anastasio Bustamante. I'd write his name down, Bustamante. And so as the Yorkinos are washed out and thrown out and driven out like lepers from the colony, Lorenzo de Zavala flees for his life for a while and travels the United States while things settle back down. Santana cannot be touched because he's a hero, and so he, he Santana, removes to his hacienda there in the state of Veracruz. And Estasio Bustamante takes the power, takes the throne, as it were, takes the presidential chair of Mexico, and Bustamante, Anastasio Bustamante, is another one of these political generals that plagued Mexico. And the power behind his throne was Lucas Alamán. Well, they come into power. And one of the things, uh, now bringing this back, bringing Texas back in, as I've lectured, you notice I haven't said much about it, but that underscores my point of Texas being a far-flung uh, outpost of Frontera. But occasionally you will see Mexican politics and the Mexican political class, in this case the Escocesis, take up the issue of Texas. And in 1830, they do. Um, what had happened was is that uh, the Escocesis, uh, uh, President Bustamante, had sent a, another one of these generals through Texas on what was a supposedly a boundary mission. It was supposed to be an innocuous boundary mission. You know, where, where, where's the real boundaries of Austin's colony? How's it laying out? How's, where's the real boundaries of Texas? It's just, it seems like an innocuous fi fact-finding mission. The reality is it was uh, what's going on in Texas sort of thing. So uh, the man's name is General Manuel Mier Itaran. M-I-E-R. Let me just type that into your notes uh, or into the chat bar so you can get it, get it in there. This guy's big uh, in Texas history. Manuel, he's a general, as I said, he's Manuel Mier y Terran. And General Mier y Terran travels through Texas. He goes through San Antonio de Bejar, or the Via de Bejar. Uh, he goes and meets with Austin. He goes all the way to Nacogdoches in deep east Texas. He travels through and he basically uh, is uh, making mental notes and real notes in this uh, boundary uh, commission. And what he comes back to, uh, when he goes back to Mexico City, he's going to be asked the question, what did General Mier to Tehran, what did you see? And his answer is a very simple and blunt one to the Escocesis in Mexico City, uh, to Lucas Alamán and to President Bustamante. And it goes like this. General Mier Tehran's uh, report basically said, boys, you're getting ready to lose Texas. You've got too many Anglos and Americans who are living in Texas who have no allegiance to Mexico. 
They don't practice the religion. They don't practice the culture. They don't live the life. They are essentially Americans in Texas. Uh, some have legitimate uh, titles, yes, and then you have others who are squatters, meaning they just came to Texas and they just moved here without any legitimate reason to be here. You are, if we do not do anything, we will lose Texas. That is the, uh, the plain truth of it all. And so I recommend, this is me, Ari Teron, talking, and I'm obviously kind of paraphrasing. I'm not quoting it absolutely directly. But basically what Mieri Tehran says uh, is, is that we need to get a hold of Texas. We need to, con uh, to control Texas once more. We need to stop immigration. We need to, to borrow a phrase, ban illegal immigration and frankly just stop immigration altogether. We need to encourage uh, settlement in Texas that is not Protestant, that is not American, that is not Anglo. And so we need to get a hold of Texas or we will lose it. It will be taken away from us. And so the Mexican Congress, the Bustamante uh, regime, uh, the centralists, those Escocese centralists now, are going to step forward and they are going to pass a law that is absolutely big in Texas history uh, because it is uh, kind of a, a thorn in the side of the Texians. Uh, and that is the law of April 6, 1830. That law of April 6th of 1830 is going to establish uh, forts along the Texas coast, make Texians uh, pay import tariffs and taxes, and it's also designed to stop immigration into Texas from the United States. Uh, it is one of the few pieces of legislation in this time period that deals directly with, Mex with Texas or Mexican Texas directly by the Mexican Congress. And it sends the proverbial barnyard into an uproar. As some are screaming, oh my gosh, uh, what's going on here? It is, uh, uh, it is uh, going to cause lots and lots of consternation. Eventually, uh, the Mexican Congress relents a little bit and backs off some of the more strident uh, immigration uh, aspects, uh, or certainly the trade aspects of the law, but still the, uh, the marker is laid down. However, uh, Anastasio Bustamante is uh, a centralist, and like uh, I keep saying, is, is that Mexico is not stable. Bustamante never finishes his term as president. He is driven from power in 1832, so I guess you need to write that down. So the churn, the unending churn of coup, counter-coup, putsch, and, and uh, counter-putsch, uh, is going to take out, uh, at least and drive from power, but not execute Anastasio Bustamante. He will come back later on in their history. But uh, the man who does it uh, shouldn't surprise you when you hear it. It's Antonio Lopez de Santana, who in 1832 raises what that, uh, like Hidalgo, Father Hidalgo did years before, he raises in 1832 a grito. He, it's basically the grito of Veracruz. Uh, Santana said, come to me, all Mexicans, and I will uh, lift, the, uh, lift you from the yoke of tyranny of the centralist. The centralists had done things that had uh, enraged, uh, especially Veracruz uh, and their independency, uh, independent streak, especially with regard to statehood and state rights. And so Santana raised the banner of uh, insurrection in 1832. Long story short was is that Santana, not many people uh, come to his banner. His army comes to his banner. His local friends come to his banner. But Mexico does not rise up in revolution in 1832, at least not initially. However, when you have a prominent general who says basically we need to overthrow the government and he arms his men to do exactly that, he issues a grito that call to arms and there is an army around this general. At your peril, you ignore him. And so the Mexican government under Bustamante, they do not ignore uh, Santana's call in his claim. So the Mexican government sends down to Veracruz where Santana had his hacienda, had his uh, base of operations, had his own, in a sense, personal militia army. It, it, I gotta say it's personal, but it's under the guise of the state of Veracruz, but it, 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 it responds to Santana. Well, the Mexican army, the, the central government's army, uh, Bustamante's army, goes to Veracruz. Problem is, is they can't capture Santana. 
But even worse than that is, is that Santana, who had a well-known love for women, uh, every night, uh, or seemingly every night, went off and uh, slipped through the Mexican army lines to go visit his girlfriend uh, and, uh, you know, make whoopee with her. The thing is, is that uh, it was an absolute joke. It was an absolute laughable joke in Mexico that the government could not bring this uh, recalcitrant general to heel. And so it, like the high taxes and, and problems uh, of 1829 with uh, Guerrero's operation, uh, Santana's mere presence and his peccadilloes in the nighttime uh, with his girlfriend, in, in a sense, in obvious broad daylight in the nighttime, uh, basically just eroded the authority of the centralist, and they fall. So that by the time you get to 1832, the man running for president of Mexico, because that tour, uh, time, or time of uh, tour of office is up now, running for president of Mexico is Antonio Lopez de Santana. And by 1832, now coming 33, he's going to win. He is going to win. And he does. He wins, frankly, quite easily. And his vice president, put this in your notes, is a guy named Gomez Farias. Gomez Farias, F-A-R-I-A-S. Now, Gomez Farias is a true believing Yorkino Federalist. There's, there's no two ways about it. And when, by the way, when Farias, uh, who's the vice presidential candidate, and Santana, the presidential candidate, get elected in 1832, Texians rejoiced. In fact, actually, one of the greatest uh, celebrations we've had in Texas at a place called Anahuac. Some of you know where Anahuac is over there southeast of Houston, basically on Trinity Bay, just uh, just driving down I-10 towards uh, Winnie. You'd see the sign that says Anahuac, exit here. Anyways, uh, some of the Texians that were most overjoyed by Santana's victory was William Barrett Travis, he of Alamo fame. But anyways, uh, Santana wins. But the thing about Santana, and this is the last few minutes of this lecture I want to give to you, is, is the man Santana himself. He's one of, like I said a few minutes ago, he's one of the most fascinating characters I've ever come across historically. I, I, he's not a good man. Uh, there's no two ways about that. He's a, he's a depraved man, and I mean that morally. I mean, he's, he's, a, he, he's, a, he's a, arguably an evil man, uh, but he's certainly not good. I mean... How far do you go evil? I don't want to, he's, he's not Hitler in my opinion. He's not Stalin in my opinion, but at the same time, uh, he's certainly not uh, a choir boy. Uh, he comes from uh, Criollo stock. Uh, he is a Caudillo. He has uh, land and, and peons that are uh, beholden to him. He's from Veracruz. Uh, when the Spanish uh, go to war, or rather the Spanish try to hold Mexico during the revolution, Santana is going to be a, a Spanish royalist. He's going to be loyal to Spain. In fact, actually, the first time, uh, maybe in the very first time, but one of the first times he visits, Mex visits Texas, Santana does, is in 1813 at the Battle of the Medina. The biggest battle in Texas history, actually, is out west of San Antonio in the Revolutionary War of Mexico at the Battle of the Medina. Uh, and it was there that the royalists absolutely routed the royalists absolutely routed the rebels. I mean, just not only did they beat them badly, they, they slaughtered them. And the man who saw what happened to the royalists, there's going to be what the royalist uh, officer who saw what the royalist, uh, the Spanish royalists did to the, to the Mexican rebels and also the Bejarinos is Santana. He said, this is basically, he learned the lesson that this is what you do to rebels, which is shoot them, drive them from your midst, run them out, scorched earth. But after this, the revolution is drawing to a close and the plan de Iguala is starting to make up and Spain's desperately trying to hold on, he, Santana was called in and he was asked, do you want to be promoted? And he said, yeah, I'd love to be promoted. And they said, we'd like to make you a colonel. And he said, great, excuse me, lieutenant colonel. And he said, great, I'd love to be lieutenant colonel. So they promoted him that day. The Spaniards did. That afternoon, right at the end of the revolutionary period, Santana went and saw that met the Mexican rebels uh, who were quickly becoming the Mexican government. And he says to Iturbide and others, he says, uh, uh, I, I'm here, what can you do for me? And they said, we'd make you a colonel. And he said, sign me up. Then, when uh, Agustin de Iturbide, General Iturbide, who had been a royalist himself, but now a Mexican rebel emperor, was appointed and elected, as it were, by the 
by the Mexican Congress made uh, Emperor of Mexico. Santana says, I love Interbiti. I love the Emperor. Long live the Emperor. And oh, by the way, Santana is all of about 30 years old when this is happening. And Interbiti, who's about 55 or 60 at that point, has an older sister. Santana, who had about as much, uh, had the morals of an alley cat and is about as much compunction as an alley cat, or the alacrity of an alley cat, uh, he, Santana, is going to uh, sidle up to this older sister who's in her early 60s, and he tries to marry her. I mean, he, I mean, it's uh, everybody who saw it said, oh my gosh, this guy is, what type of man does that? Well, Santana does. And then when Interbeady falls in 10 months, he ditches his, uh, his girlfriend, his uh, attempted girlfriend or attempted wife, and then denounces Interbeady and says, I'm a Yorkino Federalist. Santana was uh, uh, mercurial. Uh, on the one hand, we talk about his uh, political machinations. Uh, he is a first-class womanizer. He, he, he slept with everything. I, I mean, he slept with every woman he could, seemingly. Uh, I mean, there's lots of famous stories. Uh, one of y'all did a, uh, I don't remember who it was, but one of y'all did the essay on uh, Emily Morgan or Emily West Morgan, uh, the supposed uh, Rose of Texas. Anyways, that's one story that's probably not true in my opinion, but there is a story out of San Antonio during the Alamo siege in February, March of 36, when Santana was there with his army of operations. Uh, he was uh, walking, the way the story kind of goes is he was walking through or riding through the streets of Behar uh, there as they're waiting to assault the Alamo on March 6, and he sees this beautiful young, about 18-year-old Bejarina, uh, and she was... She caught his eye. She was beautiful. And Santana, who was my age at that point in time, basically, maybe a few years younger now, but he basically said, uh, put, sent word to the family, said, I'd like to get to know your daughter. Wink, nod. Wink, nod. I'd like to get her to know her biblically. And the family said, you can't know, you can't meet our daughter. You can't know our daughter unless you marry her. And Santana said, fine, she can be my wife. I'd be glad to marry her. And so Santana organizes a marriage at the San Fernando Church, now cathedral, but he organizes a marriage a sacramental service and he marries this young Bejarina, this 18-year-old girl, uh, and so on. And then they have a honeymoon there in Bejar and, and uh, you know, that sort of thing. And they have a good, uh, he, he's occupied. But after the fall of the Alamo on March 6th, they don't leave for another three weeks anyways. Then finally, when Santana puts his army on the road to chase after Sam Houston and eventually ends up at San Jacinto, Santana says to his wife, he says, oh, by the way, uh, dear, we're not really married. That man who married us, that priest that you'd never seen before, he's on my staff. He is a fictitious priest. And oh, by the way, you're going to become a nun now. He married this, married this girl in a fake, you know, no, no quotes about it, a fake uh, marriage ceremony there in San Fernando Church so he could have himself effectively a concubine during the uh, the siege in the fall of the Alamo. I mean, nasty guy. Uh, yet at the same time, he is a hero of Mexico. No two ways about it. You know already about 1829 stuff, but uh, in 18, 18, yeah, 1838, I believe it was, maybe 39. Anyways, when the Spanish, uh, excuse me, the French show up, he defends uh, Mexico once more and in this case, loses a leg. Well, that's pretty uh, dramatic. And the problem for Santana is, is that, well, his surgeon was a quack. Uh, and the surgeon didn't cut the leg right. Left of, if you know anything about amputations, you're going to have probably, you're going to cut, you want to cut that bone smooth. Anyways, well, the surgeon cut the bone like so, and he did fine there. But the surgeon cut back too much around the skin. And so he had to pull that skin down around the stump and that bone. And so all the, and for the rest of Santana's life, he's going to walk on a, on a prosthetic leg. Rest of the story goes like this, though, is he was president of Mexico for the umpteenth time. He's like president of Mexico 12, 13, 14 times, if you count it all up. But um, he, after he lost his leg, Santana then will have a state funeral for his leg in Mexico City. A month or so later, he falls from power once more. His enemies, Santana's enemies, dig up his leg out of the cemetery and the wild dogs in Mexico City drag his leg through the streets. I mean, and then on top of that, to, to cap it all off, oh yeah, by the way, he was a major investor in Wrigley's chew, uh, chewing gum, Chicle. 
Um, and last but not least is that when he becomes president of Mexico for the first time in 1833, coming now 34, Santana had been elected. And then he announced right after he'd been elected, I think he may have even been inaugurated for a day. He announced, my health is bad. I'm going back to my ranch. But that was him. Was he? Did he do it by calculation or was he actually sick? We don't know because the madcap, that's the way. That's the way I'm describing him to you. He, the madcap could never. You could never be sure. Was he sick or was he just playing politics? Can you imagine Joseph Biden getting elected president of the United States and then all of a sudden, about a day or two before or after his inauguration, saying, "You know what? I really don't feel like I can do this job right now. I'm kind of sick." Kamala, uh, you do it. Vice President Elect Harris, you're up. Can you imagine Trump doing that? Certainly not Trump. You can't imagine Obama doing that. Certainly not Obama. But uh, Cruz, uh, Santana did. Why? Only he knew, we think. So that's a good place to stop. It's 1.14 in the afternoon. Uh, let me hit the stop button.